last century, over 300,000 Irish people left their homeland forever to begin a new life in Australia. They were not rebels, but the rank and file of an emigrant army who sought peace and equality. Dispossessed of their native soil, they hungered for land of their own. The soft green of Ireland became just a memory as they drove deeper and deeper into the heart of the driest continent on earth. In this raw land, until recently a penal colony of Britain, they became pioneers of change. When Burke and Wills came right up through New South Wales, through Queensland to the Gulf, and they spread the word that there was good grazing land up here in the Cooper areas, well, it was the last land available. The establishment had all the good land around the coastal areas, and this was the last land for the native Irish to come up and get. It was free for the taking. So up they came, and they came and they stayed. Pat Tully's people were pioneers in the vast emptiness of Queensland. Jurax, Costellos, Tullys. Their names are legendary here today. Though they started life as modest tenant farmers in Ireland, they ended it owning kingdoms that far exceeded the length and breadth of their native land. A couple of hundred sheep, about two miles ahead of you, and they're moving down the street right into your land. Right, son, will we chase those sheep off the plane onto the fence? Pat Tully now presides over an ever-expanding Tully clan. But he can clearly remember his own grandfather, Patsy, who laid the family foundations here. Patsy had come out from Ireland after the famine, but he never talked much about the country of his birth. I think he wanted to leave that behind, that the blazes with it. That this was a new life and a new land, and he wasn't mucking around with old prejudices and old hate. He was a much more tolerant man than Uncle. Uncle was fired. Of course, Uncle came fresh from the Troubles. But they were far away from Patsy here. He had to work hard and living, and the Troubles didn't mean the same things to him as they did to Uncle, who was on the spot. And the spot was Woodford, this small town in the west of Ireland, which today commemorates liberation from its troubled past. A hundred years ago, this district was the scene of hard-fought battles during the land war. Only 3% of the Irish owned the land they occupied. The vast majority had to pay extortionate rent to absentee landlords. In Woodford, the tenants had had enough. They organised themselves to fight back and Pat Tully's great-uncle Francis, the one holding the bottle, was one of their most vocal representatives. Today, he is being honoured, and Pat Tully has journeyed from Australia to see it all happen.
Francis Tully deliberately withheld his rent as a protest against the system. He planned to make a public stand against the thousand soldiers and police who came to evict him from his house. Notice of order of ejectment between the Honourable Marquis of Clonricard, creditor, and Francis Tully, debtor. I would think Uncle would take the view that when our Lord said, love your enemies, he did not have absentee landlords in mind. Uncle was very definitely a fiery fighter. He'd fire quick. Pat Tully's uncle was known locally as Doc Tully because he prescribed leaden pills or bullets as a cure for landlords. definitely felt very strong emotion at that house. It's one of the most moving experiences of my life to see them there and everybody. The, the tribute and the feeling for him as if it was yesterday is the strange thing instead of a hundred years ago. These people speak as if they knew him. One said to me, do you have the forehead? And with a little more hair and a fine full beard, he said, you wouldn't know if you'd be the gentleman to the life. As if he'd spoken to him or known him a week ago. There's that sense of Identity with the past here. The past rules them. Doc Tully had been a boat builder in his day, but his activities in the land war earned him several spells in prison. When he was 59, he was visited by his brother Patsy, home from Australia for the first time in 50 years. I was half afraid to come to Ireland. You listen to Uncle and Maggie Bowles of this green land and you sort of believed in the fairies and you didn't want to believe otherwise, you know what I mean? sort of known the land all my life. My dream world is a true world. Patsy Tully and his wife Sarah took Doc back to Australia with them. He was never to return to Ireland. In Australia they lived together in the old homestead at Ray. And it was there that they died all three within weeks of each other. so hard to, to give us something. They, they weren't acting for themselves, they were acting for the next generation. To remove injustice so that it would not prevail against the next generation. What would you like, Uncle Pat? Carl drink or a cup of tea? Oh, Patsy worked hard, at, not so much for himself, but so that his sons would have things that he never had. Because I'm a fourth generation land owner here, I look at that what uh, great granddad did. He came here and he settled here and, and because he uh, worked so hard then I've got the opportunity and I'd like to see that for future generations I, and not just my family but for, um, for anyone you should look at the land that you're on rather than as an owner as a, 
custodian, someone that, that's looking after the land rather than, than just using it. So 100 years later, the Tully attitude to land has somewhat mellowed. But in Ireland, the people were obsessive about land because it had been taken from them. And without it, you didn't survive. Even with it, life in 19th century Ireland was a struggle. Here, some things have changed remarkably little over the last hundred years. The church and the pub are very much the hub of the community and Irish or Gaelic is still the first language. One of the things about tradition is that you don't change. Some people are not willing to live their lives like that. And those people usually leave. Porrick Keneally and his wife Bronwyn are leaving Ireland for Australia. I do think that a lot of people will think that why, why should I want to leave? I have everything that I want. <laughs> you know, we should just kind of settle down now and enjoy all of the rest of life. And, and I find that kind of terrifying because that's like dying, really, you know. What do you think Australia's going to give you? New opportunities. Australia is like a totally different world. It's a fantastic challenge, and uh, I couldn't kind of uh, go on without giving it a go anyway. What are you going to miss about it the most? Oh, I suppose the uh, the beauty of it, the uh, security of living in a small community. I had the, the Latin, you should say, key in Latin. There's a very strong bond uh, between people here, I think, in the sense that in most of the work, you can't do it on your own, basically. You have to get someone else to help you. Say, for instance, the Kara, for one thing, which you need two at least the Karach and usually three people to leave down the Karach. So there's a very strong kind of feeling that you, are, you can't survive as one. Irish who went to Australia in earlier days did so for a variety of reasons. Some to escape poverty and oppression. Others, like Porrick, out of a spirit of adventure. 
but no one escaped the pain of parting. It breaks my heart. Mm. It does. I hope that he'll be home soon, that he won't stay out there. Yes. That's one thing, that's one consolation I have, that he'll be looking forward to have himself and mom and home begin with us. Because I'm very fond of her too. I did give her a beat once in a while, you know. <laughs> <laughs> You felt that there was a future for you in America. Yes. Do you feel that there's a future for people I in Australia? I don't know. I don't feel that there's a future here for him. Uh -huh. He have a nice job on his hands and a lovely place and everything. I don't yeah. know. Don't dare think of it, Brown, but no, keep him over there. Will you? <laughs> Family tradition says, I will know where I came from. I will, if, if I have any children, I'll be able to pass on things to them that uh, are uniquely me and this island. Who knows, maybe one of them will, in five generations, may want to move back here. About one third of a million Irish went to Australia in the 19th century. Only a drop in the ocean compared to the millions who fled to America in the famine years. The Irish who went to Australia left after the famine in the 1850s and 60s. They were poor, but not destitute. Half of them were women, and 20% of them non-Catholic. had what they called prayers in steerage as usual this morning. They were hardly off their knees till they had a handbox among themselves. A most infernal lot of blackguards and the dirty Irish papists. About four o'clock yesterday morning, we were aroused from sleep by a huge wave coming down the main hatch and completely flooding the inmates of the berths on the lee side of the vessel. The screams of the women and children were terrible. Three sails were torn as if they'd been made of paper. Their shreds beat against the masts with dreadful violence. The wind alternately crowed like a cock or hissed like a nest full of serpents. That night seemed to last a hundred years. We trembled for ourselves and for those poor men, high up in the yards, balancing precariously above the abyss. One slip of a foot, a broken rope, and their lives are lost. We 
We're up all night praying for our lives. This morning, some of the Protestants were trying to buy bottles of holy water from us Catholics. The voyage was a shared experience that none of the emigrants would ever forget. They no longer belong to the old world, but not yet were they part of the new. For those who came to southern Victoria though, there were echoes of home. It's uncanny. And for a lot of them, this would have been the very first place that they saw Australia. Yeah. Now you're Irish. Oh, what I, do you I, think they I, would I have... I got a lurch when I saw this. Yeah. I mean, just, you've got the fields, you've got this, this cliff. It could be the, uh, it could be Kerry, it could be the west coast of Ireland. It's cold, it's grey. It's about to rain. It's just like home. And what did you think yourself when you first came to Australia? Well, I just loved the, the wide open spaces. There was a sense of freedom and I could be anonymous, I could get lost in it. Whereas in Ireland, there's always going to be somebody you know around the next corner. What were the things, though, that you missed about Ireland when you came here? I missed the music terribly. Siobhan McHugh is a Dublin radio producer whose research into Irishness in Australia led her and me to this distant enclave of Ireland and its unofficial archivist, Pat Glover. It's just beautiful, that music, Pat. It's just, I could be in West Clare. Well, I suppose if it wasn't in this spot, uh, there'd be nowhere else in Victoria you'd find it. it you know, if you can't find Irish music in an Irish community, what can you find? Or where can you find it? The Irish settled in, in Victoria, the majority of them settled around here in what Father Frank Madden christened it the Green Triangle. And that Green Triangle is the most arable land in, in this district and uh, absolutely beautiful for growing potatoes and onions. The Irish started coming here in the 1840s, working first as tenant farmers for the two big squatters of the area. Little by little they started to prosper. Today, the richest farmers in the Shire of Belfast are descendants of those original settlers. And the Irish are still coming to this part of Victoria. I'll explain that to you, Patrick. This here now, a green of means, green girl means think of me. In this case, it means in memory of yes. Andreas Lumbrook. A rug of a gunt and clar near, and it says here he was born in County Clare. Rug of means born yes. in County Clare in Ireland. And then he was 84 years of age. Yeah. And fear Gaelic Yorkshire means he died a true Irishman. Yes. Um, so an Irishman, as a rule, never lets his country down. An Irish exile do not let his country down. And I think that he died as he lived a true Irishman, true um, to his home, his country and his God, more or less. And there are other signs of an Irish tradition here too. The man who's lived across the road from the pub about half a mile from the pub, in a beautiful old freestone house, limestone, a detached kitchen, beautiful kitchen, no ceiling, and the rafters are black with smoke. It is a lovely old place. Can you tell us Stump, about your grandparents? Come uh, out in a boat to Melbourne, and they'd probably come in a boat to Port Ferry. 
What do you know about Tipperary, where your people, where your grandfathers came from? Nothing. They come from Tipperary. A long way to Tipperary. Only Ballyhurst is a Ballyhurst was a place outside Tipperary, a little place outside Tipperary. Would you like to go there? Well, it wouldn't be much good if we go on there now. I guess in Ireland we found uh, probably a different attitude. In parts I'd say yes, there is sort of sophistication, but yet you know, not really bursting themselves with ambition, just to be quite contented. Paul O'Toole's great-grandfather, Lawrence O'Toole, came here from Dublin around 1873. Within 10 years, he became a landowner and built the family home. The original homestead still stands. Tonight, all the O'Tools have gathered together for the centenary ball. It was Kevin, Paul's father's idea. He's the one with the strongest sense of family history. When we got to Ireland, he, he couldn't wait. He got out of the, um, off the ferry and kissed the ground and then straight into a telephone booth and wanted to see if he could find some O'Tools. We hadn't done much research at the time and um, he found, sure enough, there was about eight in the book and he, he was dialing away, taking down their names and addresses. And this became our itinerary, going from one to another, seeing these O'Tools. And uh, not as if we could establish any great relationship, but it certainly made for good fun. OK, sorry about that. But the last supper will be after... The, the last sitting of supper will be after the Pride of Error. Thank you. John was saying to me last night that when he went back to Ireland, they were saying to him, oh no, but you're not really Irish, we're the Irish. But John said, well, you know, we're just Ireland in a different part of the world. We're the same stocks, we just moved away. And Irish eyes had good reason to smile in this part of Australia. For just 50 miles away from Port Ferry, gold was discovered. It was 1857 and the rush was on. When first I left old island shores, the yarns that I was told. How folks out in Australia could pick up lumps of gold. How gold dust lay in every street and miners right. Towns sprang up overnight, like this one, Sovereign Hill, where the reconstruction of the gold rush days is now a major tourist attraction. With my swag upon my shoulder, black Billy in my hand. I'll travel the bushes of Australia like a true born native In the first ten years of mining alone, Victoria produced one third of the world's gold. The population almost trebled. And among those to whom Australia beckoned were thousands of Irishmen anxious to leave the post-famine depression behind. Life was fancy free for those who did strike gold. Relatively few miners ever made their fortune, but the authorities couldn't cope with the numbers who wanted to try. Take the rest of the men and close up on them from the bottom of the feet. Harassed by police about permits and goaded by unfair licensing laws, the miners eventually struck back. Hold your title, the word of command. In 1854, some 800 of them rose up against the authorities in what became known as the Eureka Revolt. You ready? Fire. Their leader, Peter Lawler was Irish, as were about half the diggers. 
among them none other than Pat Tully's grandfather, who'd arrived out from Ireland the previous year. Eureka was really a fight between democracy on the one hand and the authorities on the other, and the Irish were prominent on both sides. But Patsy Tully had had enough. And anyway, it wasn't really gold that he was after. It was like the American Western rush when all the wagons were going everywhere. From all parts of Queensland right out, nothing seemed to frighten. Patsy Tully and his wife, Sarah Durack, join the rush to the land selections of the great outback. They wanted to get away, to get to somewhere where they could live their own life without the spectre of authority. And they had a particular hunger for land of their own, which they'd never had an island. They were always had land under the landlord. But this land was different. It was huge and often inhospitable, given to drought and bushfires and extreme heat and dust. They must have known it was hard land that they were uh, coming to, though. Well, life was hard. See, even down in the closely settled areas, life was hard. Life was never easy in those days. Thera wasn't happy here, was she? I don't think she was particularly content at all. I mean, she'd probably had her tears in private. God knows we all do. And she had as many as most because she had a very difficult life. And yet she stuck it out. Why did she do that? Well, the Irish, their faith was always an integral part of their whole life. Their conduct and everything was controlled by it. And uh, one of the doctrines of their Catholic faith is that you accept suffering and you accept hardship as the will of God. The Catholic Irish weren't the only ones who were determined to prosper. Thousands of Protestant Irish came out from Ulster to settle in the choice farming land of the New South Wales south coast. Well, they were mainly the uh, Northern Irish Protestants from the western part of Northern Ireland, from Fermanagh and Tyrone, uh, who certainly were not penniless. They were arriving in Sydney, and I remember the comment of the immigration agent about one man, or he had a cheque for 200 pounds in his pocket and was off to Kayama to buy a farm. And to encourage a landed gentry, the government offered subsidies of land to settlers with means. But I think certainly that was an enormous advantage. If you were a self-reliant, uh, determined, competent farmer, you could achieve great things because land was made available to people who could stock it. Uh, so that some of these people got enormous grants of land, something like 100,000 acres. And there was another group of Irish immigrants who were immediately welcomed by the governing classes of Australia. These came from the class known as the Anglo-Irish. My family came here a thousand years ago, and uh, we are still here. I feel uh, Irish. And what would you say their characteristics were? Competent and bloody. The Anglo-Irish had a confused identity. They were not completely recognised by the English or the Irish, but fitted comfortably into the role of colonisers. Well, they were much employed all over the world in, at all levels in the British Empire, which has now ceased. Having spent a long time in the British Empire, well, for about 20 odd years when it existed, uh, one was always coming across Irishmen who were um, judges, policemen, soldiers, administrators, governors, they were. Lord Dunsany is very much a remnant of the old ascendancy class.
The Anglo-Irish were highly educated. They went to places like Trinity College, Dublin. And so many emigrated to Australia in the 19th century that the most commonly held degree in Melbourne was from Trinity College. And they lived in style in Australia. A style maintained by their numerous domestic servants, who were usually Irish, and not particularly appreciated by their employers. They're a set of creatures whose whole knowledge of household duties barely reaches to distinguishing the inside from the outside of a potato, and whose chief employment hitherto has consisted of such intellectual occupation as occasionally trotting across a bog to fetch back a runaway pig. And most galling of all, they didn't know their place. One of them had to be brought before a magistrate because she insisted on wearing patent leather pumps at the wash tub. Romance indeed. But many of these biddies, as they were derisively known, were just poor orphan girls left destitute after the famine and brought out to be wives and servants for the male-dominated population. It was a hard life for a woman, in the city or the bush. Out here, Wendy Tully has to be teacher, nurse and general manager as well as wife, mother and cook. Bridget, sound it out first. Sound out picnic to yourself. Now, Bridget, just sound it out. Come, pick, pick. No, it's P-I-C. Yeah, yeah, Mick. N-I-C. Good, say it again, say it loudly now. P-I-C-N-I-C. Wendy, what sort of problems do you have raising nine children in the bush? Well, I don't feel it's a big problem because, um, well, actually, the kids are, are good out here. They have plenty of, of um, activity to do. Go! We've had quite a few accidents in our family and I guess the first thing we have to think of is ourselves to save our children, not the doctor like you do in a city. We've had the odd split head, we've had um, broken legs, we've had you know, fractured skull, we've had a few bad injuries where the kids have they've had to go away. I'm, uh, you know, you can worry I guess, but it's life, I accept that as life and we just have to cope with it. As it comes. What about your Catholic faith? Is that important to you? It is, yes. It is in times of... Um, well, we lost one little boy and I guess it was our, that was our fate. I'll get emotional. It was worse though in the old days. Sarah Durack lost five of her 14 children. Two through lack of nutrition, two in accidents, and one little girl who wandered away from mass one day. They went straight to the creek. Well, they were hours diving in the creek. Instead of going down the creek where she was, she was three or four miles away, getting further. She was only three. And it wasn't until three or four days later, there was a big search organised. But it's a big country and it's hard to find, and only a very little foot, you know. I finally found a dead one man's horse shied away. She was dead with a little bunch of flowers in her hand. It must have been hard priest because I remember my father telling me that the old priest was rousing on grandma because she was weeping. He said, woman, he said, how dare you question God's holy will? She said, I'm not questioning God's holy will. A woman is entitled to grieve for a child. It was a cruel land. Many of the Irish couldn't adapt to its vastness and its nature. Defeated, they flocked to what Bishop Dunn of Queensland called the unwholesome lanes and purlieus of the bloated cities. Generations of Irish lived and died in the mean streets of Collingwood and Richmond and Surrey Hills and Redfern.
The Catholic faith boosted the Irish, and the church gave them cohesion and strength. Right across Australia, they built schools and hospitals and provided a focus for the community. I mean, the thing that I had as a kid was growing up in a community which was fairly close-knit and ran to the old Irish patterns, the power centred around the parish dances and so on. And one would sing songs and one grew up with songs and one grew up with rhetoric and one grew up with grog and gambling and horses and people. I would say it's a culture in which people are much more open about their emotions. It's sentimental. And the sentimentality often um, covers some um, deep bitternesses based on memories of things that have happened in the past. It's very tribal. And people really do feel you should defend your own family and the people you've grown up with. That they're, they're your tribe, they're very important to you and you're loyal to them, regardless of differences. In primary school especially, I think we did have a bit of a sense of being a minority group, perhaps not quite a ghetto, but certainly a group that was singled out and uh, disliked by a middle class uh, WASP uh, people. But the Catholic Church's attitude to that was if you can't join them, beat them. They trained their boys and girls to aim for the top. The nuns believed in education for girls. They were very ambitious for the brighter girls. They were confident and they inspired us with a fairly high degree of self-confidence considering the pretty poor circumstances we, we were in. They were um, political in the sense that they had no time for the, the monarchy, um, a sentiment which I acquired very early in life. But they weren't self-conscious about it. I mean, that they were Irish women or they were women from this sort of background and uh, that was their view of, of the world. Up until the 1950s, many of the teachers in Australia's Catholic schools were Irish-born. Good afternoon, gentlemen. There was no state aid for religious schools until the 1960s, so the schools were kept going by contributions from parents and the recruitment of volunteer staff in Ireland. Sheridan, your socks. Come on, pull them up. When I came to this school, we were brought up in a tradition of, of the Irish. It was customary to attend and march in the St. Patrick's Day uh, march up um, Burke Street to, to, to salute as we walked past Archbishop Mannix sitting there in the car. We played games that were Irish in origin. The class texts that we used, for example, the brothers themselves brought out a reader and a number of the stories in that reader predominantly were of um, Irishmen, Irish heroes, Irish saints, Irish scholars. They gave you a sense of Irish history and anecdotes and so on, and the sense of your own past, which of course uh, I've never forgotten, and, uh, and for which I'm grateful. On the other hand, they were trying to merge a, a double little system there because they wanted their boys to be accepted. And to be accepted, it was still necessary to conform to an establishment where Irishness was very definitely not welcome. We were conscious of the heavy establishment in Australia, which was enormously oriented towards England. Uh, most of them regarded England as the real thing, and Australia as some appendage, and anything important and worthwhile was in England and not here. And I was, as my family were, those around were very resistant to that. We regarded ourselves as Australian and we were proud of the Irish connection and uh, uh, 
very conscious of how badly they'd been treated. The Catholic Church helped the Irish to consolidate their place in society. But there were other forces afoot that wanted to change the whole basis of that society. Well, the Australian Labor Party had its origins in the trade union movement, and the trade union movement in its early days represented workers, low-paid workers, workers who needed organisation to protect them. And, of course, given the his history of uh, Irish immigration to Australia, there were many Irish Australians who were low-paid workers. And so, flanked by the Catholic Church on one side and the Labor Party on the other, the Irish began, slowly but surely, to move up the social scale. Some ran small businesses in the towns or built hotels of their own. They became employers instead of just employees. And some even became famous as well as rich, like the Tuis, who made a fortune slaking the working man's thirst. The old taunt that the Irish were always priests, publicans or policemen ceased to apply by the 1950s as the Irish moved into almost every area of society. They became prominent in the professions, particularly in law. They were the underdogs in the country. They had to strive to achieve success. And in doing so, they had to attack the institutions and the laws and the policies which were producing the lack of equal opportunity, the discrimination, the social injustice. They sought and they achieved a nation broad and tolerant enough to include them as they were. And in achieving this, they too changed. The forces they largely generated made them strongly unionised and attached to a uh, significant political party. And may I say, with all uh, humility and modesty, <laughs> that one simply cannot fault their political judgement in uh, the political party which they predominantly came to support. Well, they went anywhere. They forced their way upwards. They'd been oppressed for centuries, but once they got the opening, they went like a breeze. Just on behalf of the Woodford Heritage Group, I'd like to thank Padre Tully and his wife for coming all the way from Australia to unveil this plaque to his uncle, Doc Tully. Ladies and gentlemen, and I might call you my Irish friends and fellow Irishmen. This today is one of the most memorable incidents of my life, and I'll remember it always, because we celebrate a famous British victory of 1,000 men when they evicted 13 men and two women from their home. And the tale went home how the Irish fought for their very lives, but blood in the end must tell. And it makes me proud that I have that blood in me, and please God, the blood will run true in my children. Now, I thank you all. No, thank you, everyone. When all beside of the Jew keep the West's asleep, the West's asleep, alas and well, may Aaron weep that cannot lies in slumber deep. Greatness are in the little people of a nation. And it's a greatness that has a power that tyrants can never break because it's the spirit of a people owing final allegiance only to their country and their God. Lashing sea and 
And if one on a vigil and Ireland were colonies of Britain. But a resurrection of Irish nationalism, the dream of Sinn Féin, the concept of being themselves alone, was to sweep away British rule and change Ireland's destiny forever. The echo of that catharsis was to polarise Australia. The division in society was potentially so explosive that many feared national disintegration. At the heart, Australian identity still remains ambivalent. A sense of nationality was important to anybody. Which you Australians lack today. You haven't even a flag of your own. You don't fly your flag, you fly the bloody British flag all the time. You have no nationality. At least we have here in the south of Ireland. The Irish have a strong sense of nationalism. But in Australia, there are still many old skeletons in the national cupboard. This program is about what happens when these issues become inescapable. It is Easter Sunday in Sydney. The event that is being commemorated here happened over 70 years ago on the other side of the world. It was far from Australia, yet through a series of extraordinary people and events, it changed the destiny of this country. It is very fitting that we should meet at Easter time when we commemorate the rising of the Lord from the dead. And that too is a signal for us to remember the rising of the Irish people in 1916 when they struck a great blow for the self-determination, the freedom and the unity of Ireland. There are people in British-occupied Northern Ireland who are still prepared to carry on the fight. There is a time laid out for nothing. There is a time laid out to weep. There is a time laid out for sowing. And a time laid out to weep. There is a time to love your brother. And there is a time for hate to cease. And if you sow the seeds of justice, you can reap the fruits of peace. Burmil Mahabad, God bless you all. By the end of the 19th century, the Australian-born descendants of Irish immigrants had taken on a strong sense of Australian identity. Yet many of the prejudices of the old world were still with them.
Like many families at that time, there was a bitter division in my mother's family over a mixed marriage. My father was a strict Presbyterian and they didn't want him to marry an Irish Catholic. No, they, they didn't want that. So when he married her, they wouldn't even accept her. They wouldn't accept us as children. That was what it was like in those days. It was as if the national family of Australia was divided, both in life and in death. Here you can see the ranks assembled. Irish Catholics on one side, Protestants on the other, like two armies massed for war. The irony was, it took a war to bring them together. In the first AIF, Australians of Irish Catholic origin were enlisting, fighting and dying relative to their proportion of the population. Australians were united in the traditional blood sacrifice of nationhood. He was an army that suited the Irish Australians. Spirited, independent volunteers, famous for refusing to salute British officers, loyal only to each other. Ireland had been moving towards home rule. Like Australia, it would have self-government within the British Empire. Australian Irish were in full support, but the war and the question of Ulster were holding up progress. The Irish were putting their fair share of blood into the battle. Some 200,000 Irish volunteered for the British forces with the promise of home rule in view. But another army was forming in Ireland, the Irish Volunteers, created to combat the Ulster Protestant armed resistance to home rule. Suddenly, while England was totally preoccupied with the war, a major rebellion broke out in Ireland. On Easter Monday, 1916, Irish rebels, with some German and American aid and encouragement, seized the General Post Office in Dublin. They declared themselves the provisional government of an independent Irish Republic and called on all Irish men and women to support their cause. British guns were brought into Dublin. The rebels held out for a week. There was a feeling now that Ireland had reached a point of no return. As the poet W.B. Yeats wrote of his beloved Ireland, Now and in time to be, where evergreen is worn, are changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. Australians were shocked. The Empire loyalists saw the Irish as stabbing Britain and her allies in the back. Even in Ireland, the rebellion was at first unpopular. And then the British made a fatal mistake. The long memory of the cruel oppressor came flooding back to the Irish. Fifteen of the rebel leaders were executed and another 2,000 were jailed. Gradually, the failed rebellion gained the public support, which would eventually ensure its success. Tom, how did this event in 1916 affect your family? 
Well, I wasn't round at the time, but my father's eldest brother had joined the Australian Army against the, all the advice and instruction of his father, who was a man from Cork and who saw the war in those terms as an imperial war. 1916, I suppose, went to show my grandfather how right he was. And when my uncle came back from the Western Front, they argued so bitterly that the young man, the young Australian soldier, left home and uh, the next the family heard of him was 1974 when he died in the bush and some clippings of book reviews of mine were found in his, um, in, amongst his possessions. So that was 54 years of exile from his own family which had been brought on by the bitterness that uh, arose out of 1916. In Australia, only one prominent public figure spoke up for Ireland. Archbishop Daniel Mannix of Melbourne turned his forceful vision back to his homeland. Australia, so recently united by Gallipoli, was about to be divided on the question of the loyalty of Irish Catholics. In Charleville, Cork, the memory of a famous son is passed down by those who loved and admired Daniel Mannix. Mannix was born into a reasonably prosperous family and attended a Christian Brothers school. Perhaps it was the Christian Brothers who gave him a dormant sense of nationalism. It was a tall, self-assured, ambitious young man who entered Maynooth Seminary. The neo-Gothic grandeur of a triumphant church suited him well, and he rose to become the president of the college. Mannix himself was, of course, consistently the brightest of his year. Why do you think they sent him to Australia? But quite frankly, I think Mannix was a little too big for Ireland. Other people felt uncomfortable while he was around. He's a rather dominant kind of character. And he came at a time when the Irish Catholic community was looking for leadership. They were constantly being sneered at, ignored or derided. Now, I have very vivid memories of this when I was at school. It survived right up to my school days. Mannix arrived with the air and bearing of a prince. Nobody could accuse him of being ignorant or a slob or anything. He was such a magnificent specimen. I mean, he was a magnificent looking man. And all of a sudden, he began saying things which they had wanted said, but were never going to say themselves. But it was the stand that he took on conscription that brought him into direct conflict with the Australian Prime Minister, William Morris Hughes. Hughes believed the Australian Army needed more recruits for the Western Front and decided a referendum would be held to introduce conscription. By 1918, he was an ardent Republican. Right. He had no feelings for the Empire or the Crown. Uh, he had no personal loyalties except to his people as he saw them. Mannix unleashed a bitter sectarian backlash that was to divide Australia for years to come. The echo of a distant drum sounded loud in the rallying places. Well, I think his most outstanding statement was at the beginning of the conscription referendum when he just said, Australia's done enough in this war. Now, that was a shocking thing to say because the whole of the Protestant ascendancy, and, and there was a Protestant ascendancy here at the time, uh, equated loyalty to the empire, the king, 
All of these things one could never do enough. And the echoes of sectarianism carried on for the best part of the 20th century. The annual blood match between Scots College and St Joseph's in Sydney for many years transmuted into sport the bitterness of days only recently gone by. In the struggle for equality, it was the anglicised establishment that controlled the game. Many of the Irish found it necessary or expedient to deny their origins. Being Irish was not all that socially acceptable when I was a kid. And you were sort of, ah, uh, it was much better to be sort of upper class and English and owing an allegiance and so on to the English Queen. And once we started to become teenagers and be interested in the opposite sex, there was quite a lot of uh, uh, censorship by parents on both sides about, well, you know, you don't want to go out with her, she's a Catholic girl and you never know where it might lead. So many of the people of my generation and of the previous generation were shamed out of being Irish felt humiliated, couldn't get jobs because of it. I mean, that's the basic thing. My name is Lynch, Patrick Lynch. And in 1933, when jobs were pretty hard to get, a friend and I went looking for work and finally got a job at Grace Brothers. And on Thursday, the paymaster came around and passed me an envelope. And I said, oh, this is not me. This is Lansbury, my name is Lynch. He said, while you're working here, your name's got to be Lansbury. I said, well, I don't like that. He said, will you make up your own mind? One of the other shop assistants told me that it was the usual practice for Irish or Catholics to have their names changed. So I walked out and I'm not sure whether I was fired or whether I resigned, but let's say it was a dead heat. My mother told me that the same thing had happened to her before World War I. In a sense, the Catholic Church tried to drum it out of them. Uh, they were told to get on. Boys, some of these examiners are terribly bigoted people. And like nothing better than make the going tough for Catholic lads. Nothing frightens them more than to see the professions filling with Catholics, boys and girls pouring out of the colleges and convents and taking up positions of responsibility in the professions and public service. Position their kids aren't bright enough to win. So, if you have to refer to the Pope, then my advice is to skip the question altogether. It's my guess it's a question put in to trap the unwary. Call him the Pope and refer to Catholics as Roman Catholics, or occasionally Papists, then they'll never guess. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Today we can laugh at sectarian conflict, but in 1917, Australia was in uproar. The Irish rebellion, two failed conscription referenda, and fears of Bolshevism following the revolution in Russia brought deep division and hatred into Australian society. On St. Patrick's Day 1918, it was alleged that Dr. Mannix failed to remove his beretta for God Save the King. A huge public rally in Melbourne demanded the government prosecute Mannix. The government responded by gazetting regulations prohibiting Sinn Féin and any support for the independence of Ireland. By 1919, the conflict in Ireland had degenerated into an all-out war for independence. On St Patrick's Day 1920 in Melbourne, the full weight of Irish Catholic power demonstrated for Ireland. The controversial Catholic John Wren, gambler and racecourse owner, assembled 14 Victoria Cross winners and 10,000 returned soldiers to escort Mannix in triumphant procession through the streets of Melbourne.
here was a frontal challenge to all the prejudices and bigotries of the anti-Irish. The heroes of Australia gave their support to a free island and thousands of Catholic schoolchildren spelt it out. When Mannix visited America in 1920, he met up with the Irish Republican leader, Eamon de Valera. But when he tried to visit Ireland, he was arrested on the high seas by a British destroyer. In 1921, Mannix returned to Australia to a tumultuous welcome. But for Irish Australians, the Sinn Féin campaign was nearly over. A conference in London in 1921 accepted the Anglo-Irish Treaty, which ended the war with Britain and created the Irish Free State, but divided Ireland. Vinny, how did you feel the day that the British finally left? Well, we were all delighted, naturally. See, because they were a bit of a turn on our side all the time, you know. We were glad that, that they were leaving our country. It was the greatest achievement in the history of Ireland. Because all our attempts to free our country had failed. The Irish Australians were enormously relieved but new troubles were looming in Ireland. We were very elated that we left, but uh, then the negotiations started, and uh, I think I speak for most of old IRA men, they were very disappointed. Well, they said, thank God them fellas are left. We can fight among ourselves now. So we did fight among ourselves <laughs> in the Civil War. But that must have been a great disappointment to Oh, you. terrible, terrible. The vision of opinion over the failure to achieve a full republic and over the creation of the British state of Northern Ireland led to bloody civil war. The heroes of the fight against England now turned on each other. Irish Australians were horrified. Said Bishop Barry in faraway Tasmania. I am completely disillusioned. This is not the Ireland of my youth. But Romantic Island was indeed dead and gone. So many of its brightest hopes were in the grave. By the 1920s, Irish Australia had decided it had gone far enough with Ireland. Thereafter, they diverged. But the bad old days are over. Today, Australians are rediscovering their Irish roots linking themselves with a people whose history goes back 8,000 years. But who are these people who made up a third of Australia's population? Here are the pagan Gaels who arrived as invaders. Here are the Catholics converted by St. Patrick. Here are the Vikings who invaded them, and the Normans, and of course, the English. Somehow they have all blended together into the Irish people and that blend has been passed on to Australians. When I went to Ireland for the first time, when I walked into a bar and I could have been in Australia in terms of the way people relate to each other, very open, very democratic, people start talking to you straight away, even more so in Ireland, I must say, than here. Yeah, I loved Ireland. It was, it was everything I expected it to be. It was sort of green and wet and friendly and just nice. You mm. feel immediately at home. And Irish people who come out here say they have the same feeling. Can you give me three words to describe the Irish character? <laughs> uh, think of that Heaney poem about that Ireland's uh, very 
small, but it's boggy, deep. Whereas America and presumably Australia are very large, very wide, but very shallow. There is use, no bog underneath them. Maybe we're deep, but not wide. I would use one adjective, I think. Warm. Ireland is not a cold place. I, I would say... It's not cold. Ireland is not a cold country. I would say we're bruised. Nice people, I would say we're, we're bruised. The most obvious characteristic of the Irish is that we're a nation of begrudgers, I think. Of course, none of us around this table is a big grudger. None of us. <laughs> we are all warm, <laughs> lovely people. We are yeah. all fulfilled. Warm, bruised, bruised, bruised big grudgers. I suppose that here. kind of sums us <laughs> up. <laughs> Who were the Irish that came to Australia? And where did they come from? An Australian researcher, Richard Reid, is doing a computer analysis of Irish immigration. The most exciting thing is that you can really get people back into exactly where they came from. You're not just talking about a county, but you're saying these people are from the parish of Clonaldi, County Tipperary. That's really the, the basis of starting to study them. So what sort of density and locations did they come from? Well, that's the most intriguing thing. Uh, if you go to the middle of County Tipperary and take a sort of radius of about, uh, say, 50 kilometres from the centre of Tipperary, you will find within that radius about two-thirds of all your Irish immigrants to New South Wales in the 19th century. It's, it's that dense. So you're looking at counties Clare, Tipperary, Galway, Cork, Limerick. From up on top of the Rock of Cashel in Tipperary, you will look out on the birthplace of thousands of Australia's 19th century immigrants. There are links back to the convict period, there are links to landlord sons who are coming out and enticing assisted immigrants to come. It really is a hundred different reasons. From here, you can see the birthplaces of a Victorian Premier, an O'Dwyer lady who, as Daisy Bates, mastered 188 Aboriginal dialects. Most of the population of Burrawa, New South Wales, Three cottages claim to be the home of Ned Kelly's father. And a small farm where the late judge Lionel Murphy's father was reared and which his cousin still owns. Why did the brothers have to go away to uh, Australia and America? Yes. Because he and his brother set off to Australia to better himself and wanted to make a new life and got married. He and his brother married uh, my mother and her sister. And strangely enough, their names were Murphy too. In the town of Corophon in County Clare, the great famine that drove so many Irish to new lands is now providing a legacy of useful jobs for young local people. For here, the histories of thousands of families are recorded. The director, Nacy Cleary, yes. says that there's an Australian heritage search going on that rivals that of the United States. Oh, Nolan, Nolan, mm. Nolan. Mm. Which means the descendant of the one who was noble or famous. Ah, oh, you're joking. No. <laughs> you didn't know that? No, 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 of course not. No, 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 no. 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 I can show that to various people to, yeah. uh, to, to disprove some of the things That's I've said right. about <laughs> The Australian artist, Sid Nolan, is planning to build a home and start painting in Ireland. Church records, you see. See? Yeah. Mother of Protestant. Yeah, Protestant yes. The children baptised all in the same mm. day. Mm. So this, uh, uh, Paddy Nolan, is yes. his relative, uh, I'll go to Newtown and then go down the road. That's and then I, right. I find the rockiest place in the barn and that there will be Paddy Nolan. Sid Nolan's first ever meeting with his cousin Paddy will turn the family clock back a hundred years. When I put back the, the dial or the face of the clock again, see now it's very time. Well, what, why does it keep moving? Because the catching has gone out of it. 
There was little, little, little catches on it that had worn off. Is an hour really that important to you? No, because I know it will be an hour slower an hour fast. So I'd rather do a bit of deduction. <laughs> Get there. Taking out the other now. Cake's baked. <laughs> Lovely to see you. And I heard that this chap Paddy Nolan I claimed he was a relative of, of mine, so I went to see him, and indeed it turned out that he was. We, we were distant cousins. And it's a bit of holy water. Holy water. Holy water. Well, then treasure that. Yes, good. And then he took me down to a spot which he said his great-grandfather had lived in. It was a, a ruin uh, underneath that hill. No, it just did it. My father was born in that house. Yeah, it only needs a roof on it. And his grandfather was born in it. There was nine houses here. And uh, so I said, could I buy some land around this ruin, see, and, 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 and rebuild the ruin or put a cottage on it, and, uh, and he was delighted. Oh, it is lovely, because... I'm not related to any Northern, only this one. One Northern family immigrated to South Australia. That was Sydney's people. And the rest of us stayed here. And are you happy that you stayed here? Yes, I am. <laughs> what and is it that attracts you to these austere sort of surroundings? Well, I, I think it's just that it's got a lovely kind of white light, you know, shifting white uh, light, the, the polar opposite of Central Australia. And a shape like that big thing there, that is like a grey airs rock, isn't it? And since one of the places I love best in the world is being up in Central Australia, I try and transplant that to here a bit. And how's your Irishness affected your work? Well, I think basically it's... Uh, uh, it's staking everything on, a, on an emotional response and not an intellectual one. One of the great qualities in uh, human beings, hopefully, is a kind of compassion. And I think the Irish have that. When you're here, you, you, you see that they have that quite strongly, and you feel it in, in their language towards you. I would like to think there's a bit more compassion in the Australian character. And, and, and to be truthful, I'd like to think there's a bit more compassion in mine. And sometimes, your Irish past will find you, even if you're not looking. The town of Ballyshannon was the birthplace of my great-grandmother. And I remembered a family painting, a small watercolour that she did in 1850. And there it was on the top of the hill. I pulled over to film a statue of the Virgin Mary. And just on the off chance, I asked if anyone had heard of the McQuaid family. Mostly they were taking... I was directed to a bar run by a local undertaker, John McKenna. It's the sort of thing that can happen to you in Ireland. I found a treasure of family history. And they're all dead now, of course. And they lived up in the Westport. There's a marked resemblance there, I think. Someday I was hoping that someone maybe belonged to the McQuaid's would come along, and uh, that's the reason I kept them. <laughs> that's wonderful. <laughs> I mean, what a discovery. I discovered that my ancestor was a blacksmith and built these gates. And all because I stopped to film a statue of the Virgin Mary. I'm a freeborn man of the travelling people. Got no fixed abode with nomads, I am numbered. Country lanes and byways were always my ways. 
The Irish, who are most like the poorest of the immigrants who came to Australia, are the Tinkers. Well, we knew the wards and the resting places and the small birds. Some came to Australia, but others have been living on the road ever since. All those trucks going past them, you don't even notice them. Don't notice them. You'd be lost without them. <laughs> yeah, we do, yeah. <laughs> they lead tribal lives, speak a secret language, trade in old iron, and build pochin stills, and die from alcohol and the effects of social neglect. In the 19th century, in Australia and America, the Irish were committed to lunatic asylums, as they were then called, in proportions far greater than the numbers in the population. You were dealing with very oppressed people with very few resources, and when they landed in what was, after all, a pretty hostile environment, many of them just couldn't manage and gave up. They didn't have the resources to make a place for themselves. According to Ireland's foremost authority on mental health, Dr Ivor Brown, there are still deep-seated problems in the national psyche. What is the madness of the Irish? The madness of the Irish, I think, is to me a basically a cultural situation. Uh, that if you find any people who are oppressed and in a dependent state over a long period of time, I think you'll, you'll always see an increase in mental illness and most other kinds of illness. This country is probably in several ways uniquely dependent. We've the dependency on the church, we have the dependency on what was a colonial British service. And I say we have because it's still going on. The culture hasn't ch really changed, even though we have our own government. And um, you get a mental attitude there in the whole culture, always looking to outside. Somebody else is going to solve our problems. You could say the Irish are suffering from a kind of national schizophrenia. That notion of division, mm. of not being able to get together, Mm. is undoubtedly, I think, culturally still with us. <laughs> this is for the boys of Wexford. At Boolabo, as the sun was setting o'er the bright May meadows of Shelmalier, a rebel hand set the heather blazing and brought the neighbours from far and near. The Republic of Ireland is changing rapidly. As a member of the European Economic Community, the focus today is on industrial development. Ireland has the youngest and most highly educated population in Europe. And the Anglo-Irish Agreement is striving towards a peaceful resolution of the problems of Northern Ireland which still remains under British control. The education system is attempting to play down the violent past. How many, how many would subscribe to the view that the IRA have something really to offer uh, to the Ireland of today? It's hard to say, but the IRA represents a pride that I think most Irish people have. Like, to fight, to fight, to fight for a cause, which is, I suppose, point the sky for some people, but for others, it's. Justified. Justified situation, yeah. It's not needed at all. I think it's uh, an old idea going and fighting for your country. I think uh, people like in the IRA should condone or, you know, follow the anglo irish agreement to give it a chance to work. Economically, Northern Ireland is very weak and the Republic isn't too strong either. And I feel that Northern Ireland would kind of bring down the Irish economy. But I'd love to see a 32 county Ireland. It's everyone's dream. This new republic is both nationalistic and tribal, and nothing strikes fire in the Irish like an Irish football final. Like its Australian derivative, Aussie Rules, Gaelic football is hard, fast and thrilling. Today, 
the Northern Ireland county of Tyrone clashes with Republican Kerry, and the blood-red hand of Ulster flies proudly in Croke Park, Dublin. For this one moment, Ireland is united. The Gaelic Athletic Association brings the 32 counties of Ireland together in a unique way. fighting a losing battle, but uh, they're still only fighting the same battle as we fought. The British are still in the part of Ireland, and that's what we took up arms for, to put them out. They refused to go out for, with the will of the people. Someday you'll return to your valleys and your farms And you'll know To visit the Catholic and Protestant ghettos of Belfast is to walk on the edge of darkness. Through these fields of destruction Baptisms of fire I've witnessed your suffering As the battle reached high They say we're a fighting race Even the Brian Barry was telling me, 10, 14 He was fighting when the Danes came And from that on they were fighting ever since You know, all along that's the way it'll be, I think, till the end of time. Australia has the same proportions of Catholics to Protestants and has seen the dark days of sectarian division, but has been more fortunate than this sad, tormented country. For Australia has space and opportunity for a new beginning. We're walking down the Falls Road. And my son was only 10, and that's only five. And this black soldier pointed a gun at me. And she turned around and says, that's very bad manners. Don't point a gun at my mum. Says, we don't do that where we come from. Before they came to Australia, Kate Hughes and Lila Lean would never have spoken to each other. Kate was a Falls Road Catholic. Lila was a Protestant from the Shank Hill. They met in a supermarket in Melbourne. Would this have ever been able to happen in Ireland? No way. Definitely mm. not. So what do you think made it possible here in Australia? You've got your freedom, I'd We've say. got no Paisley here. Mm. <laughs> You've got freedom. So what do you feel about the Protestant side in Belfast? What do you Well, feel it's about? the way you're brought up. You're brought up to hate them. But the priests, the religion, because that's all you got in school. Don't go near them. No. Protestants are no good. You know what I mean? And what do you think about that now? What do you think about well, since I came out to Australia 22 years ago, I'm sorry it ever happened in Ireland, because all my friends are Protestants and we get on well. Mm. And I think it's pretty bloody stupid, really. Even in the city, when you went in the city for the searches, your bags and things and all like that, I couldn't get accustomed to that. Would be a good country. Would be. If Britain gets out of Ireland, really and the people start living together. That's all we want. Everybody live together, happy. Just like me and Lila. The V band was so child along. A fiend she quoth in the Keneally 
left his home in the west of Ireland to make a new home in Australia. What was your first impression when you walked into that bright sunlight this morning? Oh, I thought it was a Banza town. <laughs> But the old days when one in three immigrants came from Ireland are long since gone. These days, less than 2% are Irish, in spite of a record number of applications. I guess I miss the small community. There's a certain sense of uh, security in a small community, which you don't find here in the same way. But on the other hand, here there are great opportunities. Those who do come are finding an easy acceptance in a society with strong Irish roots. I found them very friendly, easy to talk to, probably less secretive. <laughs> I wish I had you in Christmas Day was about uh, 32 degrees Celsius. I had no difficulty coping with that, you know. Around Christmas time, something new when the church has to advertise to get people to go there. <laughs> That's something uh, we didn't have in Ireland. There's no problem getting the churches filled there. This was once called Irish Town. The suburb of Bankstown, once an exclusive Irish settlement, has now become a melting pot of ethnic Sydney. Full circle. Here, the Irish have become the establishment, part of the dominant party. The Vietnamese and the Lebanese have become the new Irish. But true to the spirit of old Ireland, Kevin Ryan has become the conscience of the Labour Party. My political birthplace was in the Labour Party, and totally, I suppose, because of my Irish background. The very qualities, I suppose, that drew me to the Labour Party, the very same sort of qualities that have taken me away now, namely that perhaps rebellious spirit, but also this desire to see justice done by all people and not uh, be one of the mob. I'd seem to strike out on my own before what I see as a fair go for everyone. The Irish are a very proud race, which is good, but at the same time may uh, result in the fact that when they make goods and get a good social standing, they tend to perhaps look down on the next wave of, uh, of migrants coming in. The Irish should be very, very sympathetic to these newcomers. Unfortunately, a lot of Irish, for some reason or other, oppose Aboriginal land rights, yet it's the Irish of all people who should be vehemently on side with the land right issue for the Aboriginals, because they, of all people, have had their land taken away over the years. These streets in Sydney were once populated by struggling Irish immigrants. Now they are a ghetto for the people who lived here long before the Irish even thought of Australia. The Irish have long gone, but the ghost of something Irish, the old spirit of protest, still echoes in these streets. And Irish blood, mixed with Aboriginal, carries on the fight for recognition and a fair go. Burnham Burnham is an advisor to the New South Wales Government on Aboriginal affairs, and one of the emerging voices for the Aboriginal people. I coined the phrase Shamrock Aboriginals because of the Aboriginal Irish physical connections. It's the Aboriginal leaders have produced the fighting qualities that we need to achieve, in our case, land rights and respect. When you look at the names of all the Aboriginal leaders who are foremost in our struggles, um, Pat Dodson, 
Pat O'Shane, Gary Foley, um, Michael Miller, uh, Robert Riley, Clary Grogan, Lois O'Donoghue, all Aboriginal people who are really at the top in our struggles for equality, particularly in the areas of land rights. I've often said that I got from my father the, uh, my, my fighting spirit. And uh, he's, he's the Irish part of me. And um, the Aboriginal, I think, uh, oh, to laugh at life, I think. There remains a lot of affection for the old country. And the St. Patrick's Day Parade in Sydney is still a colourful event. But it's as much a celebration of life in Australia as anything else. Today, Australia and Ireland are on different journeys. Ireland is a republic, but is it yet a unified nation? Australia is a nation, but not yet a republic, and remains ambivalent about its future. And if you ever wonder what happened to the spirit of the Irish, just go to a dance anywhere in the bush on a Saturday night and see for yourself if they're not having a good time. When I reach my Across the world. 
well to be transported so far, the chance of ever coming back so minute that it was almost as absolute a state, Australia, as death is. It's the same as sending someone into another plane of being. And uh, people were very conscious of this when they were shipped away. The story of conflict, which sometimes grew into open warfare. And then suddenly you get this incredible, thrusting, dynamic figure of Ned Kelly, which appalls some people and delights others, but you can't ignore him. Douse the lights! Conflict that cut so deep into the Australian psyche that history never acknowledges. You see, the Irish Catholic community, which was a big one, it was uh, a third of the population, uh, suffered very much from an inferiority complex. They were sneered at and derided. They were second-class citizens. I don't think there's any doubt about that. It's the story of confrontation between the Irish and the English, between Catholic and Protestant. I mean, to be Irish was bad enough, but to be Catholic as well put you beyond the pale. Between labour and capital. There is a very high proportion of uh, Labour Party members with uh, Irish backgrounds, and uh, it's our turn to govern the country. A conflict between those who claimed Australia for Britain and those who wanted Australia for Australians. Yeah, I think the Irish have been probably the driving force in achieving uh, some measure of social justice. And that conflict still has an echo which is heard today. And there's a very strong Aboriginal Irish connection. And I think that's because of this fighting energy for emancipation against the kinds of oppressions that Aboriginals have faced and the Irish have faced. And it was inevitable there would be a physical link up. But the story of the Irish in Australia is also the story of the making of a national character. The laconic humour of the outback, the jokes, the touch of larrikinism, the loyalty, the rebellious streak, the individualism, the sense of self-mockery, the hatred of pompousness and bombast. And I find that that's both essentially Irish and essentially Australian. Like singing Matilda, you can keep all the rest. For Irishness is so much a part of us that we're not even aware of it. The test. Now some can explain it, but I never could. It's enough to be Aussie. It's Rafferty's rules. It's Murphy's law. And, like and it's the life of Riley. Like it's even the Irish name on the beer can. I feel immediately at home when I went to Ireland. I thought, I've been here, and it had an Australian feel to it. Yeah. The Irish have learned a lot of their characteristics from the Australian. <laughs> The essential Australian character is the way of looking at the world, what we are. In my view, is born not at Gallipoli or in the bush, but of Irishness protesting against the extremes of Englishness. The untold story of the Irish in Australia has inspired Professor Pat O'Farrell for more than 20 years. And I thought that this was a great big gap in Australian history, and in fact, a way of looking at Australian history which is new and true. Australians of Irish origin will obviously have a particular interest in Professor O'Farrell's work, but it will also be welcomed by all Australians seeking to know why we are what we are. I went to Ireland in search of the source of Australia's Irishness. And we followed another Australian, Tony Doherty, who was trying to unravel something of a personal mystery. I don't think I was very interested in Ireland at all for the best part of my life. So in a sense, there was a little bit of rejection of that Irish past. A lot of my interests were pretty well hooked up with the establishment, rugby, working in corporate life. Sydney. A lot of my interests were, were sort of British, I think. And the Irish part is becoming clearer and clearer to me. It happened in a funny sort of a way um, back in Australia only a couple of years ago. 
there was a Melbourne historian by the name of Barrett, and he was passionately searching for the descendants of my great-grandparents. And what he taught me was that my great-grandparents had been involved in an eviction up in this remote corner of Northwest Ireland in Donegal. By evictions. Are these any of the cottages that the evictees were? No. They're about ten miles down the road. Straight down here? Yes. Great. Garten. Thanks a million. Here, love. Thank you very much. A thousand years ago. Ireland had its own culture and was ruled by Gaelic chieftains who built stone forts like this one. The O'Doherty clan in Donegal was one of the most powerful. The last O'Doherty chieftain, Cahir O'Doherty, was killed by the English in 1608. The story is that he was seven feet tall. But this country round here is still Doherty country. They tell me that about one in five of the people who live around here still have the name Doherty. Your family name links you to a particular place in Ireland. And of course all of the history and legends and myths that go with that place. You don't get any sense of that in Australia, except with the Aboriginal people. Tony Doherty's family in Ireland were tenant farmers on a vast estate which fanned out from Glenvay Carlton. The landlord, John Adair, has never been forgotten or forgiven by the local people. What sort of a guy was Adair? He was a type of person that is common of today, though not so common possibly then. His ambition in life was to make money by buying and selling property, but he had no control over his ambition. The tenants were particularly afraid because they heard that he was going to replace them by sheep. That he would make more money by grazing sheep on the land. So they feared for their lands and their livelihood, which was a very poor livelihood at that. Would my great-grandfather have called him an Irishman? Oh, no, no, no. Your great-grandfather was of Irish stock going back for thousands of years, and there for maybe a hundred years previous to that. He was a newcomer, relative newcomer. Money speaks, and it spoke then more powerfully than it does today. John George Adair was one of a class commonly known as the Ascendancy, or the Anglo-Irish. They were English who had become the aristocracy of Ireland. years ago the first British came to Ireland, taking the land by force and eventually reducing the Irish to the status of serfs in their own country. From the 17th century on, the British planted thousands of English and Scots settlers in Ireland, whose presence and laws imposed an English culture on the native Irish. These settlers were granted land which they then rented to the original Irish occupants. It was this landowning, mainly Protestant elite, that was known as the Ascendancy. And as their estates grew strong, prosperous and overbearing, the old Gaelic Irish 
sank further and further into poverty and into bitter resentment. I'm trying to find out why I get angry about injustice in Australia today. Now I find that there's a ghost in me that has been struggling with that for all the time. My own family lived in a farming community on the shores of Loch Garten at a little place called Derry Vey. That was a very close community in Derry Vey. They were in clans, clusters of houses together. For 240 people to live in that small area, it would be like a village today. So they must have been mixing freely with each other all the time. I found out from a local historian here, May McClintock, that my great-grandparents and their neighbours were all small farmers. The famous John Adair was not the most humane of landlords, to say the least. And when he realised that sheep were more profitable than people, he decided the tenants must go. So he set out to serve notices on these people to quit. And when they didn't leave, he brought in the police armed with battering rams. The entire village was wiped out. And 47 families, including my own great-grandparents, James and Mary, were just left on the side of the road. Their homes destroyed in front of them. The eviction became so infamous that the news reached Sydney and a part of the Irish community in Sydney developed a thing called the Donegal Relief Fund to bring as many of these people out to Australia as possible. The tragedy was that the only option for the old and the very young was the workhouse. The majority of the others went to Australia but a few were left behind to pass on this story. Everyone in the pubs and Churchill and every other place that I sing it in, they always say to me, well, there nobody knows John Adair but yourself. How come? <laughs> well, you see, my father, God rest him, and the ones before them, they had the song, you see, and it was put down from one to another. Oh, is that right? You know that kind of... Yeah. 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 They brought the share of to our door And quenched our fire so bright my aged grandsire was no more. He died that very night. My mother weeps, her youngest child, a child of beauty rare, just four months old. So making my love done by John Adair. Many a weary wretched face has left the mountain side, has climbed Glen V's old rugged place, and steamed the Atlantic tide for fifty homes he leveled all, and wild birds fall there, and fifty thousand cutters fall. On cruel John Adair. At the time of settlement in Australia, the tradition of oppression was well established throughout the kingdom of George III. When we're talking about Georgian England, we're talking about a universe of pain. We're not just talking about pain inflicted upon uh, individual groups. There is, a, as it were, a continuous background noise of anguish, which applies pretty much to everybody. Except, of course, Lord this and Lord that. King George and his ruling elite may have tried to put the Irish in their place, but that was no guarantee that they'd stay there. In 1798, the Irish rose in arms against the British. It was an event that was to have a significant impact on the young penal colony on the other side of the world. Bull of Oak, 
As the sun was setting o'er the bright meadows of Shelmalir, a rebel hand set the heather blazing and brought the neighbors from far and near. Then Father Murphy from all Kilcarmick spurred up the rocks with a warning cry. Arm, arm, he cried, for I've come to lead you for Ireland's freedom. We'll fight or die. Vinegar Hill is one of the, the great symbols now of Irish military history and Irish political history. And in many ways, it's a symbol of the beginnings of the tradition of armed opposition to the British presence in Ireland. The decision to fight a pitched battle here in Vinegar Hill was monumentally stupid because they were a badly armed uh, guerrilla army uh, fighting against uh, professional soldiery and obviously that just wasn't on. And when the battle began, the hill was peppered with uh, artillery, cannon, gunfire, and the rebels, armed with just rusty sides and pikes and so on, they had uh, no equipment to deal with that kind of barrage. And eventually, after an hour and a half of that, they just scattered towards Wexford Town and managed to disperse. And then the British cavalry came up onto the hill and into the area around it, pursued the fleeing rebels, and in particular cut down the women, the children, the old people, and the kind of camp followers and hangers-on who were obviously weren't as fleet as foot or as mobile as the actual rebels. Their posterity will continue forever, and their glory will not be blocked out. Every year, the St Mullins community put up plaques in the form of pikes on the graves of those who fought for Ireland in the 1798 rebellion. Somewhere in the region of 3,000 to 5,000 people died on that day of the 21st of June, 1798. Is it a particularly Irish thing, do you think, to celebrate a disaster like this? Perhaps we do have a, a liking for uh, the noble failure and the epic and heroic effort to defy destiny or defy uh, superior odds. Mm. And perhaps there is a, an element of that in the, the Irish character. The cause that called you may call tomorrow in another fight for the green. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And the perception of the past is equally important as what actually took place. They decided that the only way to get the rebels to surrender, they had to offer them a fair deal, and uh, that option was uh, to be transported to Australia. And so a spirit of rebellion and heroic failure, a sense of martyrdom was confirmed and thanks to His Majesty's Government, directly exported to Australia. By a lonely harbour wall, she watched the last star fall, and as the prison
What they found was this hot grinding wilderness of uh, gum trees and sandstone ledges with very poor soil in between them, only one stream, the tank stream, which became hopelessly polluted. Everybody was in a sense united by the false democracy of hunger and the guards were constantly trying to find means of raising themselves above the level of the starving convict, though they themselves were starving. Because the Irish in the early stages of the colony were denied what they perceived as their religious rights, this added to the fund of resentment and it added to the sense of otherness which the Irish felt. For most of the early years, the Catholic religion was prohibited in the colony, as it was in Ireland. But Mass was celebrated in secret places. And how many newcomers I have known to have stolen into the woods to hide their prayers, trembling to be discovered as though they were doing some guilty thing. The Irish were singled out for special treatment because they were perceived as dangerous right from the start. I find you guilty of the charges put forward and tainted with the canker of rebellion. It is the Lord's will that such canker be rooted out before it corrupts and destroys beyond all redemption. And it is in accord with his will that I sentence you to punishment of 75 lashes. Next. Now. Samuel Marsden, the famous flogging parson, would routinely, in his capacity as magistrate, hand out horrendous punishments to Irish convicts as a form of torture in order to get them to confess to their supposed plots. The number of Catholic convicts in the colony is very great, and these in general composed of the lowest class of the Irish nation, who are the most wild, ignorant and savage race, governed entirely by passion and always alive to rebellion and mischief. These worst fears were confirmed in March 1804. All of you will be remembered as the man who struck the first blow against tyranny on these shores. You are loyal, you're steadfast, and you're true. And a credit to the land that gave you birth. And again, I give you my pledge. Death or liberty! Death or liberty! About 300 convicts, led by the Irish, rose up against their jailers at Castle Hill outside Sydney, which they renamed Vinegar Hill after the uprising in Ireland. The rebellion was brutally put down and nine of the leaders executed. It was another heroic failure for the Irish. But it showed that the Irish in the new land would not accept the injustices they had suffered in the old. Uh, the sense of being doubly colonised as Irishmen in Ireland and then as convicts in Australia bit very deep into the whole Irish ethos. The focus of that oppression in Ireland was Dublin Castle, seat of vice-regal control. When the British left in 1922, the new Irish government, with a fine sense of irony, preserved it as a sort of museum of horrors, a collection of the outrages suffered by their people in the days of British rule. It's interesting when you look at this page, you've got cow stealing, highway robbery, stealing potatoes, mm -hmm. larceny, and yeah, down here you've got a high treason. It shows you roughly the, the percentage of people who are sentenced for political crimes. It was uh, very small. The vast small. majority of them are for crimes uh, connected with um, providing food for families and so on. The records can be misleading though, as Robert Hughes discovered when he was researching his book on the convict era, The Fatal Shore. A great many of the people who were transported for 
political actions, what their crimes were recorded as, were simply crimes against property. There was certainly a policy of translating political action into common crime, so as not to enable them to wear the halo of martyrdom. While the records show that only 2% were transported for actual rebellion, many would agree that Ireland's crime was produced by an oppressive and foreign political system. But for those who were caught, it didn't make any difference. The punishments were uniformly severe. This 14-year-old uh, um, sentenced for seven years for stealing... Two shirts and one pair of pantaloons uh, from some persons who were bathing, for which he was sentenced to transportation for seven years. This woman is offering to uh, commit a crime in order to join her people in Australia. That's right, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. She is hereby found guilty and is to be transported to some part across the seas for seven years. The women were treated extremely badly. God save the king, remove the prisoner. First of all, they were mistreated as women under the general sexist dispensations of uh, Georgian social organization. But then when they arrived in the colony, they were also mistreated on, you know, from the assumption that they were whores. Just country girls. Uh, very little, no education possibly. Um, they tended to be in their mid to late twenties. A lot of them were married. A lot of them had children. My hopeless love was I once betrayed And now I am the last on the tweed uh, The shifts that female convicts had to make to try and survive in this extraordinarily phallocentric society which had an imbalance of something like six men to every woman were truly extreme and of course in the early subsistence economy I'm talking about in the first four or five years of the colony you know they'd have to prostitute themselves for lumps of whistle or for a handful of weevily flour to Botany Bay you must be conveyed for seven long years to be a convict maid Damned whores or God's police, the question was asked. A survey done in Australia showed that only 13% of the women were known prostitutes on arrival. What became of them afterwards was a different matter. But very low, of that 13%, only four, a quarter of them were Irish. They tended to be more of God's police. <laughs> yeah. If you want to put it like that. <laughs> Indeed, most of them could be considered as having been the founding mothers of Australia. A lot of them saw an opportunity in being transported. There were riots in the prisons, actually, when transportation ended. However much convict Australia may have been hell, it was nothing compared to the island of the Famineers. In the 1840s, the staple diet of Ireland's 8 million people was the potato. Most depended on it alone for survival. And from 1845 to 1849, the crops failed, rotted by blight. Oh, want and misery are fearfully depicted on the countenance of our people. Starvation has so completely prostrated them that they have more the appearance of ghosts than human beings. More than a million were to die in those terrible four years. A million more fleeing in the face of death to America. Unleashing an emigrant flood which was to halve Ireland's population and disperse it to the ends of the earth, even to distant Australia. The potato famine was Europe's last natural demographic disaster. But it was natural too that Ireland's leaders and people should blame their foreign rulers, the British for their heartless economic laws, their absent landlords, and their failure to provide sufficient relief. 
burnt into the heart and soul of Ireland came to be the belief that if God had sent the potato blight, the English had created the famine. The famine was to the Irish what the Holocaust is to the Jews. And thus having cleared the land of people to make way for the more profitable grazing of animals, the landlords went on to evict another 46,000 people. In a country where the past is always present, it's as stark a reality as yesterday's news. Well, my father was at an eviction when he was a young lad. They took the balloons, it wasn't hard to do in them days, uh, you know, a little bed and a table out to the roadside. And the last thing that came out was the baby in the cradle. Now it was a February day and there was snow showers in it. And the snow was falling when they took the baby out. They had a big long bar, a crowbar. That's why they called them the crowbar brigade. And they put in on this stone that was above the kitchen door. It was known as a lanta. And they loosened that and rocked it and then the, the roof fell in. These people whose names I will mention were your ancestors. They were your flesh and blood. The fathers and the mothers who reared their children through the famine years and had to suffer the loss of their homes and their little patches of land shortly after the famine. And then worst of all, they had to say goodbye to all their children as they set off for a new home in Australia. Today our hearts are sad as we remember them. But there is room in our hearts too for joy. The joy of having one of the descendants back amongst us. Father Doherty, we welcome you. Thank you, May. It's not in our power to give you back what your great-grandparents lost, but we can give you our love and our friendship. Thank you, darling. Oh, I, Father Doherty, I is a fine strapping man. Good looking man. And it's great to see him back here and there's plenty of daughters here now. George O'Dare and all his minions are gone, completely gone. And the names. From the townland of Bungorm, Hannah McAward, widow and seven children, evicted and the house levelled. John Moore, wife and two children, evicted and the house levelled. Manus Rodden, brother and two sisters, Orphans evicted and house leveled. From the townland of Arda Thur, Daniel McAward, his wife, and six children were evicted in the house. Charles Newman, his wife, son, and two grandchildren evicted in the house leveled. William Newman, wife, and four children evicted. Lord of Valley and Blood. Gaze on your high rocky steeps, shining wet in the soft summer rain. Could it be that your granite heart weeps? By 1867, a new and secret revolutionary organization, the Irish Republican Brotherhood was planning to overthrow British rule in the name of the old Gaelic order. Rebel Ireland was on the march again under the Fenian flag. I bear orders from the captain, get you ready quick and soon. For the pikes must be together by the rising of the moon. By the rising of the moon, by the rising of the moon. For the pipes must be together by the rising of the moon. Oh, Much of its organisation and help came from Irish Americans, embittered famine exiles with military experience in the American Civil War. The armed uprising was a fiasco. 
badly organized, short of guns, betrayed by informers. Yet its legacy was to implant a republican spirit as a continuing inspiration to Irish nationalism. The Fenian leaders themselves were captured and sentenced to a hideous death. To be drawn on a hurdle to the place of execution on the 13th of November and there hanged until dead, his head then to be cut off and his body to be cut into four quarters, taken and disposed of as Her Majesty shall think fit. Mm -hmm. The Fenian leaders were transported on the very last convict ship to Australia. But if their arrival was significant, the manner of their departure caused a proper commotion. A noble Welsh ship and commander called the Catalpa, they say, sailed into Western Australia and stole six Bolfinians away. So On Easter Sunday, 1876, they rode out from Fremantle to a waiting American ship, the Catalpa, and got clean away. Take care of the rest of you Fenians, for the Yankees will steal them away. This song commemorating the exploits of the Catalpa was banned for many years by a humiliated state government. But if the Fenians had embarrassed the powers that were in Western Australia, their name was being linked to far more serious events on the East Coast. Sydney was enjoying its first ever royal visit in the person of the Duke of Edinburgh when the unthinkable happened. This Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Alfred, the favourite son of Queen Victoria, was attending a picnic at Clontarf in Sydney in 1861. The band from HMS Galatea was playing. It brought all the Aborigines from uh, the settlement near Sydney. They were dancing a corroboree. Uh, lemonade men had come over and set up stalls. There were a few policemen, not many. And of course all the ladies in their summer dresses. And in the midst of it all, Henry James O'Farrell stepped out of the crowd and fired a pistol into Prince Alfred's back. But he overlooked one thing. Fortunately, Prince Alfred, being a Victorian gentleman, was wearing a pair of fireman's braces and they had this very, very strong elastic and brass uh, part in the centre. Deflected the bullet, wounded him slightly in the shoulder, but he fell down with a terrible blow, crying, My God, my back is broken. O'Farrell declared that he was a Fenian agent, a claim which prompted public hysteria. Now, it was subsequently proven that O'Farrell was clinically deranged. But the only man who knew that at this time, and concealed the facts, was an up-and-coming politician called Henry Parks. Whatever the public wanted, he was going to hustle round in front and become the leader. And what the public wanted, quite obviously, was, uh, was Irish heads and Irish blood. Henry O'Farrell was hanged. But still, Henry Parks talked of the great Fenian conspiracy, exploiting the paranoia of the public and establishing the bogeyman tradition in conservative politics. They were so believing in this Fenian scare that in one single day, both houses of parliament passed the Treason Felony Act. Not only shooting princes was a felony, but refusing to toast the queen herself was a felony. He made sure that false rumors were spread around the colony. The Irish were not just Roman Catholics. They were the, the traitors, the, the men trying to destroy the British Empire. A pack of bloody murderers, sir. Edward Kelly has become some sort of folk hero and made us the laughing stock of Australia. Yeah, you're not the only one, sir. <laughs> I want Ned Kelly, the rest of the gang, before this night is out. Today, Ned Kelly means big business in Australia. He's been the subject of countless books six feature films, and more recently, a $2 million animated live theater of his life and times. My name is Edward Kelly, and proudly living still. My soul is in the evening breeze, the gum trees and the hills. The young sons of Australia, do not forget your brave.
And I will stand beside you Beyond the icy grave You are now standing on the railway station Witnessing the scene as 500 other people did that night When the Kellys burst through the swirling mist Right out, pansies, follow me, let's go, come on! Well, what do people think of Ned Kelly? Without any doubt, one of Australia's greatest folk heroes. Always has been and always will be. But after being hounded for years, the time of reckoning has arrived. Here and now, this very evening. Freedom or oppression, death or liberty, kill or be killed. However commercial he may be, Ned Kelly is still controversial too. Bail up. To some, he was a common criminal. A bank robber, a murderer of police, a horse thief. Bail up, damn you! <laughs> to others, he remains a complex character, who strove to unshackle himself and others from exploitation and oppression. In a very curious way, people tend to see Ned Kelly in terms of their own gods and their own demons. To use a buzzword, he had a charismatic impact. The impact of Kelly was either, this is a man I want to be with, this is a man I want to, to follow, this is a man I want to align myself with, or here's a problem, here's a threat. Ian Jones has been researching the Kelly story for most of his life. Ian and his wife Bronwyn Binns made a television series entitled The Last Outlaw, probing the man behind the myth, but setting him in a broad historical context. The Kelly outbreak is against the background of what was in essence a land war in which a series of land acts through the 60s and 70s had tried to open up the land to the enormous flood of men who were coming off the gold fields when the gold was petering out. The squatters, the big landholders, were fighting to preserve their grip on the land. It's treason, you know, Ned. Not if we win it, is it? Ned Kelly emerged as a champion of the small selector group and inevitably as such was in confrontation with the police who almost inevitably, because of wealth and uh, political power, were dedicated to the support of the squatters. We're going to make the powers of B jump up off their shiny backsides and pay heed to our demands. If we can take the police chiefs alive, we'll use them as hostages for the release of our people and the blacklist get a better deal for every poor man in the northeast i can totally understand the the anger the frustration of people like ned kelly who had a basically irish police force wandering around as, as absolute pariahs with the queen's cipher on his ammunition pouch enforcing what was basically seen as a protestant law over his catholic brothers he was a hated hated figure and he inevitably became the arch enemy of people like Ned Kelly. And symbolically, the three police who died at Stringbar Creek were all Irish born. And what about Ned Kelly's Irishness? Has that emerged in any way in the show? Definitely. There's no two ways about that. Uh, out of the school buses, uh, nine of our buses that pull up here as the school buses are, are Catholics. If I get one Protestant, I'm wrapped. <laughs> But they're coming around to it now. Don't worry about that. Why do you think he failed in his so-called rebellion? It was in essence an Irish rebellion, and every Irish rebellion has the, the seed of its destruction built into it. It's a magnificent failure, but it's a failure which is totally germinated and executed by Nick Kelly himself.
The judge who sentenced Ned Kelly was Irish born, as was the hangman. By the end of the 19th century, it was no longer possible to categorise the Irish in Australia as primarily rebellious. The law enforcers among them far outnumbered the larrikins. Oh well, I suppose it's come to this. Such is life. The Irish Australians were wanting to forget their past differences with England. For Ireland, it seemed, was about to be granted home rule, a limited independence just like Australia. I am a native of Erin's Island, transported now from my native shore. Thus, in 1898, on the centenary of the Vinegar Hill Rising, which had brought their forefathers to Australia, they chose to honour their rebel past by burying it. Burying it in the person of Michael Dwyer, one of the leaders of the Vinegar Hill Uprising. Irish people and people of Irish descent here in Sydney come here on an annual pilgrimage here to the grave of Michael Dwyer, the Wicklow chieftain. This great monument is a symbol for all of us who gather here of the cause of Irish unity, Irish freedom. Michael Dwyer's remains were exhumed from an old cemetery and reverently borne through the streets of Sydney in a triumphant procession of 150,000 Irish Australians. He was laid to rest in more fitting splendour in Waverley Cemetery and with him for the moment was buried the spirit of rebellion. It was time for the Irish to become Australian. Today, there are more than 10,000 direct descendants of Michael Dwyer living all over Australia. And when from bondage we are liberated, our former sufferings shall fade from mine. A few years ago, all I could see myself was the 20 or 30 years I lived as an Australian. Now I sort of see myself over a horizon of 150 years. Daniel Freeman, wife, one child, mother and brother evicted, and house levelled. In the town land of Stag Hall, James Doherty, wife and one child evicted and house levelled. James and Mary, the people who live in this house, they couldn't even talk to me because they spoke Irish. I only speak English. I guess I see them as a young couple, and I'm the father. It's all reverse. I was coming along a road that my great-grandparents had walked away from their home 120 years ago. It explains who I am to myself now. The time has come for me to go when you all are due. The open highway calls me back to do these things I do. But when I'm trying
cradle home. Don't he go?